Well, welcome everybody. I'm Dean Harris. I'm the Senior Associate Dean of Students. I've been here seven, this is my seventh year at Methodist. And my office is over in Burns. Uh, you've probably seen the Student Affairs offices over there. We're easy to find directly across from Starbucks, Chick-fil-A, all of that. We um, also want to introduce Dr. Jackson, who's our brand new, been here about six weeks, director of the Center for Personal Development, which is the Counseling Center on campus. And Ken is back here helping us operate all day. So it takes a team to make it work. We're glad you're here. I know it's Saturday morning. You like to be sleeping. But this is important information because how many of you, um, how many of you are living on campus? That looks like just about most of you. How many of you ever lived on campus before? Okay. Well, when you know young adults all live together around and on the campus, they develop friendships, and sometimes friendships become more than friendships. And so sometimes things don't work out the way you want them to work out. And we just need to talk about when the things don't work out so well, how to make sure that you make the very best decisions so you don't end up uh, getting suspended from the institution or expelled. Because we have some um, code of conduct um, codes, I should say, that are important to us to keep our community safe. And they are different than what you might find if you live three miles down the road in an apartment complex. So we have a pretty low tolerance for keeping people violating other people against their will. So we want to talk about how to make sure that we are understanding what our policies are and trying to reduce any issues that we have on our campus and preventing any type of sexual violence. Now, I do want to preface this by saying that in April, this past April, we did a survey on campus, and we had had um, a statistically significant number of students reply. So it wasn't 10. We had a large number of students reply. And they didn't report that we have a real issue with sexual violence on our campus. That's important for you to know. So we didn't read that survey and get alarmed and say we need to create this session and we need to tell you what's going on. The thing that we did learn is that students don't really always know where to turn to report something if, if something happens. And this could be something like um, perhaps somebody sends you a text message that's unwanted about um, a sexual advance. That's not appropriate if you don't want that. So it could be that. It could be very, very serious. So in our community, we want to have an environment that's as free from sexual harassment and sexual violence as possible. We define sexual harassment as unwanted conduct of a sexual nature. That could be sexual advances, for instance, um, for sexual favors. That could come from just passing a note in class. It could become, come from a text message. It could come through a third party trying to get information, say, I'd like to be involved with you. Though that's sexual harassment. Sexual violence is when it becomes physical. Those are physical sexual acts perpetrated against a person's will. Or when the person is incapable of giving consent. And they would be incapable if they've been drinking, or if they've been drugged, or if they have a disability for some reason. The key piece to this is consent. I mean, you're adults and you're going to make your own choices. And we're not going to be monitoring. But you have to give consent if you want to engage in sexual activity. And so it can't be done against your will. We define consent as words or actions that demonstrate a knowing or voluntary willingness to engage in mutually agreed upon sexual activity. We have a video that a lot of colleges use across the nation about consent. It's about two and a half minutes long. I think it um, makes it pretty clear. If you're still struggling with consent, just imagine instead of initiating sex, you're making them a cup of tea. You say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they go, oh my God, I would love a cup of tea. Thank you. Then you know they want a cup of tea. If you say, hey, would you like a cup of tea? And they're like, uh, you know, I'm not really sure. Uh, then you could make them a cup of tea or not, but be aware they might not drink it. And if they don't drink it, then, and this is the important part, don't make them drink it. Just because you made it doesn't mean you are entitled to watch them drink it. And if they say no thank you, then don't make them tea. At all. Just don't make them tea. Don't make them drink tea. Don't get annoyed at them for not wanting tea. They just don't want tea, okay? They might say, yes please, that's kind of you. And then when the tea arrives, they actually don't want the tea at all. 
Sure, that's kind of annoying, as you've gone to all the effort of making the tea, but they remain under no obligation to drink the tea. They did want tea, now they don't. Some people change their mind in the time that it takes to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk. And it's okay for people to change their mind. And you are still not entitled to watch them drink it. And if they're unconscious, don't make them tea. Unconscious people don't want tea. And they can't answer the question, do you want tea? Because they're unconscious. Okay, maybe they were conscious when you asked them if they wanted tea. And they said yes. But in the time it took you to boil the kettle, brew the tea, and add the milk, they are now unconscious. You should just put the tea down. Make sure the unconscious person is safe. And this is the important part again. Don't make them drink the tea. They said yes then, sure, but unconscious people don't want tea. If someone said yes to tea, started drinking it, and then passed out before they'd finished it, don't keep on pouring it down their throat. Take the tea away. Make sure they're safe, because unconscious people don't want tea. Trust me on this. If someone said yes to tea around your house last Saturday, that doesn't mean they want you to make them tea all the time. They don't want you to come around to their place unexpectedly and make them tea and force them to drink it going, but you wanted tea last week. Or to wake up to find you pouring tea down their throat going, but you wanted tea last night. But if you can understand how completely ludicrous it is to force people to have tea when they don't want tea, and you're able to understand when people don't want tea, then how hard is it to understand it when it comes to sex? Whether it's tea or sex, consent is everything. And on that note, I'm going to go make myself a cup of tea. That makes it clear, I guess. And yeah, it kept your attention, right? It's an unusual video. Lots and lots of school show this video. And if you do this, that's the clean version. I chose the clean version here at Methodist University. So um, that's on YouTube. If something happens to you on this campus, anything, if you're harassed, if somebody touches you inappropriately, or whatever happens, um, you have reporting options. Now, I will tell you that, in general, um, Debbie Yates is our Title IX coordinator. And anybody ever heard of Title IX? It's been in the news a little bit. And years ago, before you were ever born, Title IX was designed to create gender equity in sports. So if you had six men's teams, you needed to have six women's teams. Seven years ago, the federal government under the Obama administration reinterpreted Title IX to include sexual discrimination, which means that if you have been uh, violated, if you're harassed on the campus, you don't feel safe to walk around the campus and fully access everything because you're concerned about who's in the library maybe harassing you. So you don't have full access to your education without being um, either harassed or violated in some way. So that's considered discrimination. And so the, the federal government um, provided resources and provided lots of questions and answers for all administrators across the, the uh, United States on how to try to reduce sexual discrimination, sexual violence on college campuses. And so that's one reason why we do this. I'm considered a deputy Title IX officer. And so more than likely, you will come report either to me or you're going to report up the chain, say an RA, for instance, and it will get all the way up to me. If you choose to report to the police on campus, they also, are, because they're sworn police officers, they will be able to help you understand if you want to take a case against another student off campus with the Fayetteville Police Department and file criminal charges. So we don't deal with criminal charges on our campus. This is a conduct system that we're running. And so it is not a court system, it's not legal sort of system, it's our code of conduct. But if something happens to you on the campus or if it even happens to you off the campus between two students, you can file criminal charges and they'll help you understand how to, how to do that. If you want to report what happened to you to somebody on our campus and it not go anywhere, it just remains confidential, you may go to the health center and talk to our health care professionals. We have a nurse and we have a physician assistant you can talk to. You may talk to any of the counselors who, um, including Dr. Jackson in the counseling center. And you may also go to Reverend Kelly Taylor, whom you met last night at Rise of Tunger. Those are confidential sources on our campus. If you decide that you are wanting to um, 
to take this pr criminally off campus, then you're going to want to preserve any kind of evidence that you have. And that means that you would want to collect any type of DNA sample that they could get um, from your clothing. You will not want to bathe or shower, use the bathroom, change your clothes, comb, brush, or wash your hair before you get to the hospital and get tested. And so that will be critical for you to, to follow these guidelines in order to preserve any kind of vital evidence if you're going to take this case um, criminally off campus. If you are simply going to keep things right on the campus, which is probably 99% of what happens with our students, um, what will happen is, is that I'm going to contact you. So let's say you're the complainant. Um, and you'll sit and I'll get a report and I'll understand that there's been a problem or you're perceiving a problem. And so I'm going to invite you to come meet me in my office. So I will find a time that works in your class schedule and I will say I look forward to seeing you tomorrow afternoon at 2. We can talk about what occurred with you. I will also invite another staff member to be in that meeting. It's usually Nan Feebig and if you may have met her in the housing office. And that way that you and I are not alone in my office, there's one other additional staff member in there to hear what's going on. But you may bring a friend from the university campus. Uh, they have to be affiliated with the university, so faculty, staff, or student can come into that meeting. We don't bring parents into those meetings. We don't bring lawyers into those meetings. And you'll never be forced to say anything that you don't want to say. But I have to ask, I have to investigate. So I have to give you the opportunity to tell me what you want to do. Um, part of what you may want to do is to um, to get counseling. So we'll talk a little bit about that, and I will talk, and I can actually pick up the phone right at that time and get you an appointment to see one of our counselors that day. We will also talk about medical care. Maybe this happened two weeks ago to you, and there's nothing really. There's no DNA to preserve or to even collect, um, but you may need to seek medical care. One of the common um, and the things that we'll do is to, um, issue no contact letters. Now, what that means is that it's a formal letter that's issued to both parties. So we'll just, for ease of understanding this, let's say it's a female who brings forward a complaint and said, and said that a male um, touched her inappropriately. Okay? We'll leave it at that. And then you're saying, um, because I've had situations where somebody touched somebody else's knee inappropriately, right out in front of other students. So it was not at night in a residence hall room. There was, it was so, but still that was uncomfortable for the student. And they said, no contact order is really all I want. I, I don't want any more than that. The no contact order will say to both students, um, and they'll be issued to both students, you can't have intentional contact with a student. That means that if I know where your class is, that I can't stand outside of the door when you get out of class waiting for you. I can't stand outside of your residence hall room waiting for you or in the car. So I can't have any intentional contact. But we're a small campus. So it's almost impossible to avoid seeing each other on a small campus. It, what it does mean is if I see you walking this direction towards the fountain and I'm walking you know, the opposite direction, we don't have to run the opposite direction. We just need to move on. Don't go in the path of that person and, and face them head on. That's intentional contact. If you're in the cafeteria and you walk in and you look across the cafeteria and you see the person, well, I'm not asking one person to leave. This is where you have to eat. But what I'm saying is that you don't go and sit down next to that person or sit directly across from them. That's intimidating. It's called intimidation, and we don't allow that on our campus. So you need to go sit somewhere else. You can't uh, discuss the details or anything about the other person. So that means um, you don't tell your roommate what happened. You don't spread rumors about the other person. Um, you don't send any kind of communication any kind of contact through social media, or just simple ways as um, talking to a best friend, and then the best friend goes and tells that person what's being said. So you just don't discuss anything. Now, last year I issued over 40 no contact orders to students. That seems surprising, right? But I would say for most of those situations, um, they, were, they were not involving sexual misconduct to start with. Um, they, some of those involved maybe only a few students, so it seems like a high number. There were not 47 students necessarily involved. Um, that generally puts an end to what's going on. In six years, I've only had one time that a student didn't fully comply with their contact order. 
and then I dealt with that uh, at a conduct level. But usually, once I put those in, in place, there's a sense of peace of mind, people leave each other alone, they go about their business. Um, and it all works out, typically. We will also help students, again, we talked about filing criminal charges, if that's something you want to do. We will talk about a room change, so let's say that you live in um, Weaver Hall, for instance, and the other individuals in Weaver, if you choose to um, want to leave Weaver Hall, we can help expedite that and get you into another residence hall. If we find that it's more appropriate to move the other individual that you're complaining about because enough evidence suggests that there was a problem, then we may impose on that person a move. If you share a class together, we can request that you get changed out of that class, if that's what works best. Most of the time in Methodist, because we're small, we don't have a lot of um, sections of classes and it would be harder to move you out of the class, you would stay in the class, the faculty member would be notified that there was a no contact order in place, and then therefore they wouldn't put you into group exercises together. You wouldn't have to do a group project. They would also know that there are no contact orders and you probably won't sit anywhere near, near each other in the class, but you're still under supervision. There's a professor right in front of you under supervision, so that works out okay. Now, let's say that um, it's very serious to you, and you want to move forward with a conduct case. So this is what it will look like. I will fully investigate, meaning that I'm going to ask all the questions that I can think of to try to get information from you. And I will prepare, prepare the administrative hearing board for the case. So then we will set up a time when the administrative hearing board will meet with you, the complainant, will meet with the respondent, that's the student that you're complaining against, and then any of witnesses, it could be a friend who was involved and saw what happened, anybody who might be a witness. And we will call them all to, to a meeting, usually late in the afternoon, say 3 o'clock or later. And a lot of times these hearings go on for four or five hours. So the hearing board will record the session and they will ask every question they can think of to try to get to the truth. Most of the time, what happens is generally in closed doors in a residence hall. Um, and it's a he said, she said, she said, she said, he said, he said, whatever the scenario. But we don't really have, they're not recording devices, and so you don't have a lot of evidence. However, we have a burden of proof that's lower than the court system. So if you went to court, a jury is going to have to um, prove something, prove you guilty beyond a reasonable doubt. You've heard that before. Anybody ever heard of preponderance of evidence? Very good. Um, that really means, that's the lowest burden of proof. That means that it's just 51% more likely that you are responsible for that behavior, responsible for that code of conduct violation. So you can't, 50-50, you're just stuck somewhere. If we can just get to the point where we believe it's 51% more likely, then we'll find the student responsible. The federal government tells us we can't have a higher burden of proof. We can't um, be uh, 75%. It has to be only 51%. Okay, so let's say that we do find uh, a student responsible for sexual misconduct, then that student has the right to an appeal. So now the hearing board said they're responsible. The student now has been expelled or suspended from the institution, but they believe they've been wrongly accused. They should not have been found responsible. They can appeal that decision. And it'll go to an appeal board. There is one student that sits on the appeal board, and that student was voted in by the student body. That's the chief justice of the student community court. No other student will sit on that appeal board. So now we have administrative hearing board with only faculty and staff. If there's an appeal, it goes to an appeal board, and that does have faculty, staff, and one student. Let's say that the student is not found responsible, and for ease of understanding, the female who brought forward the complaint is really upset that we didn't find that student responsible, then they can appeal. So it's, it's a double appeal. If, the, if they're responsible, there can be an appeal. If not responsible, there can also be an appeal. That goes on into an appeal board. The federal government tells us we have to complete this whole cycle of, of making our final decision within 60 days. But 60 days is a long time on a college campus, particularly when you need to come to resolution about what's going on and you are worried about what's going to happen. Let's say you're the accused student and you don't know if you're going to be suspended or expelled, and you, this goes on for 60 days, think about how unsettled you would be every time you try to prepare for a class, knowing when, when are we going to reach a conclusion. 
At Methodist, we're a small campus. We have very, very few of these cases, and we're generally able to expedite and get it reached um, to a conclusion within about two weeks. Okay? So I don't want you to feel like this will linger on terribly long. Again, I spoke of the fact that sanctions generally, generally range from suspension to expulsion. Suspension is a defined period of time when you're removed from the university. You cannot participate. You cannot come back on campus. You cannot uh, go to your classes even if you didn't live on campus. You can't have any affiliation with the university during that period of time. And if you're suspended in October, then you lose everything you work for. You don't get any refund of your money. You, you pack up your belongings, you move out of the residence halls, and then you're allowed to come back once you've served your suspension. Expulsion is permanent removal. That means you can never come back. It also means that if you were to transfer to another institution and they contact us after you sign a release, then we will inform them of why you were removed from our institution. So just let that be known. Let's talk about counseling. Good morning. So to say a little, did you guys say good morning back to me? Thank you. Um, to say a little bit about counseling. So let's say um, you are violated. And the importance of what we want to talk about is the importance of you getting counseling after that process. And a lot of people want to know, well, you know, why do I need counseling for that if this is what's happened? So we've listed some reasons for you in terms of what would happen with counseling. So the first thing we would do with you is just kind of help you process the stages of the trauma. And that's just clinical language for talking with you about what happened, how you felt about it, what you experienced, things of that nature. We would also help you express just your full range of emotions. A lot of things go through your mind, through your body, through your heart when you experience something like this. You may be angry, you may be sad, you may be upset, you may feel guilty, just all of these things going on. So what would happen if you were to come to counseling is that we would help you to kind of walk through all of those emotions, better understand what you're dealing with, what's going on, and how you're feeling. The next thing we would do is we would help you develop just those constructive ways of coping. Like Dean Harris was saying, we want you to have a successful time here at Methodist. And whenever you experience something traumatic, it can really have a negative impact on your academic performance. So we want to help you develop the coping skills that you need, the strategies that you need so that you can continue to move forward and you don't kind of get stuck in this place where you can't function, you can't keep going to class because like he said, it's a small campus. You would probably still run into this person and we want you to have the tools necessary to still be able to move forward. Any information, education, referral that you might need. Let's say it happens closer to the end of the semester. You start counseling with us in April or May, but you don't feel like you've gotten everything processed that you needed and now you're getting ready to go home. So you may need a referral to someone. So we would help you to develop, to develop a relationship with someone in your own city, in your own community. We would identify what those referral sources are so that you can continue just with your process of healing. Developing self-care is just what it's saying. We want you to be able to take care of yourself. So if you've experienced this, we don't want it to be the end of the road for you, the end of the path, the end of the world. We want you to be able to continue to take care of yourself, move forward, be successful as Methodists, do what you need to do in order to complete your time here. And then establishing a support network. How many of you came to Methodists with people that you know? You have other people here that you know. So we have a handful. So I'm assuming the rest of you came not really knowing anybody but the people you met this week. And so with that, part of what we would do is we would become a part of your support network, but we would also help you to establish a support network. That may be people in the residence halls, people that are with you in your majors, if you're playing sports, that may be people on your sports team. We're going to help you develop those relationships so that those people can be of support to you. Okay? And then the second part of that on the next slide, why support for friends, loved ones, bystanders? So bystanders are the ones, let's say you're in, you come home one night from a party and a little bit later your roommate comes in. And she's crying, she's upset, and she begins to tell you that she's been violated. So as a friend, you want to be a support to her. So what, part of what we will do is we will help you to know how to help your friend. 
And so oftentimes, I'm sure we've had those instances where people have come in and they've kind of told you something and you're kind of left saying, I don't, I don't know what to say, I don't know how I should respond, what should I say in response to this? So part of what counseling does for you, one part of it is we'll help you to learn how to interact and respond and be present for your friend. The other thing it does is it gives you the opportunity to express what it is you're feeling about what your friend experienced. Oftentimes people don't realize that when the people around you have particular experiences, it actually does impact you as a person. And sometimes you need to go and talk to someone about what you're feeling or experiencing. And Dean Harris is gonna come up, come back up and he's going to talk a little bit about bystander intervention. But one of the things I want you to just kind of keep in mind is I'm, I'm a big person on the golden rule, do unto others as you would have them do unto you. And so just keep in mind, even as he's talking about bystander intervention, be to other people what you would want other people to be to you. So the same thing you would want somebody to reach out and do for you, extend yourself and do that for other people, okay? So Dean Harris is gonna come up and talk a little bit more about that. These are the on-campus counseling services that Dr. Jackson just spoke of. Elizabeth Ward and Valerie McCancy, the other two licensed counselors. One of the good things that we learned also about that in that survey back in April is that students look out for each other on this campus. Um, most students don't leave campus alone, and when they're going out, I mean, wherever you're headed out in Fayetteville, there are safe areas in Fayetteville, and there's some areas that aren't as safe. But you take care of each other. I mean, they, that's what was reported in that. But, and I think that's because we're small, and you know what's going on, you pay attention. We've had scenarios where students disappeared. They didn't really disappear, but the friends thought they disappeared, and boy, were they on the phone immediately contacting public safety, and we were out searching. Turned out they'd just gone home. But it's just, it, there's a real strong safety net among students, and that's nice to know. Um, if you're going out, be aware of your surroundings here in town. Don't become isolated with anyone you don't know or trust. I mean, these are common sense um, tactics, but I think they're important to remember. Remove yourself from suspicious or comfortable, uncomfortable situations. Keep your cell phone charged, ready, and accessible if you're going out. Stay connected with your friends. Don't get lost from your friends. And again, don't drink anything that you don't um, know what it is or where it came from. And again, this is, I can't re reiterate this enough. It's never okay for anyone to pressure you to engage in any type of sexual activity. And it is your right at all times to say no, as you learned in that consent video. Anybody ever heard of bystander intervention? I mean, it's, we've been talking about this for 10 years now, probably in education. And this is really when you recognize that a friend is getting into a situation that could hurt them or harm them somehow. And you step in. You don't just play it off. You just don't pretend it's going to be okay. You step in. Get them out of it. And there are cool ways to do it. There are ways, I mean, I know it's, it's so uncomfortable to step in. Sometimes you could just grab their arm and say, come on, hey, let's go get out of this place. This is not where you want to be. We have a video that was created by the College of Charleston just down the road. And I think it um, really shows you a little bit about how bystander intervention can be effective.
she is so drunk. I'm definitely getting out of here. Hey, you wanna go upstairs? It'll be fun, come on, let's go. She's so drunk. I'm definitely getting laid tonight. I don't know, man. It seems like a bad idea. She's like really drunk. It might be a bad idea. You're right. Hey, you need this. Let's go find your friends. If something happens, at any time that you need information, you may go to methodist.edu, student affairs, click on that, and then right down here on that page, sexual violence prevention and response, we have lots of resources for you. But don't ever hesitate to go to your RA, go to your residential coordinator, RC, or anybody on campus for anything. Don't minimize it if it happens to you. And also look out for each other. I mean, again, it's a small campus, and we all have a duty to each other to help each other get through this and graduate and, um, and have a wonderful experience. So, wish you the best this year. I know it's not a topic everybody wants to hear, but it's an important one just to say up front so we can move forward, start classes Monday morning. It will be exciting. All the returners are coming back today, so the campus is coming back alive. So welcome 